Okay, so it's just actually 1.31, so just about ready to get started. Um, hello everyone, welcome to MAGFest, first of all. So glad to see you all, we're so glad to be here. Um, and welcome to the Ludo Musicology panel, um, a fancy word for the scholarly study of video game music. And so I, I'm, I'm Julianne, and I'm here with several fellow uh, academics who all work in colleges and universities, uh, teaching and doing research. And part, or maybe all, of our research focuses on video game music. And so this panel will basically introduce ourselves, uh, go through a little bit of each of what we do. We have a varying interests in different uh, topics in video game music. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll sort of open it up to a discussion and questions uh, talking about anything from how you get into something like this, how you get into the field, uh, what kinds of resources there are, uh, the conferences that we go to. I think I can speak for all of us saying that already this is the biggest crowd um, that any of us has ever had for anything that we've actually presented, say, at an academic conference. Um, so very thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, without further ado, I'll just I'll introduce myself again. I'm Julianne Grasso. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Chicago. That basically means I have finished everything except my dissertation, ABD, all but dissertation. Um, and my dissertation is on video game music, obviously, maybe, uh, and, and meaning and how people construct meaning through play and how play is a process of interacting with music. Um, and yeah, I'll, we'll just go down the line, right? Hi, well, I'm, uh, I'm Stephen Reale. I'm an associate professor of music theory at Youngstown State University in Northeastern Ohio. Oh, Youngstown is presenting. All right. Nice. <laughs> uh, I finished my PhD 10 years ago. At the time, you just absolutely could not do a PhD on, in a video game topic. It was not done. So I did work on Richard Wagner's Ring Cycle, the 15-hour beat. Look at this. Wow. I'm, I could not be more happy about that. Uh, so just in the past 10 years, it's been really exciting to watch this academic field of ludomusicology kind of grow up and blow up and explode. With uh, We have several journals and books that are out now. Uh, and it's been a really exciting process to watch a new area of inquiry sort of grow from the ground up. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Karen Cook. I'm an assistant professor of music history at the Hart School, University of Hartford in uh, West Hartford, Connecticut. <laughs> Hi. Um, I uh, also have a PhD. Actually, my, my PhD is in um, medieval music. And so most of the time, I hang out in the 14th century, uh, like you do. But what I'm particularly interested in with regard to video games, aside from the fact that uh, I'm obviously an avid gamer and I like to play and whatnot, but I, I'm fascinated by um, how much of our Western pop culture right now is medieval or medievalist uh, in its influence, whether that means, uh, you know, um, anything like actually set in a historical time period, but also all of the fantasy fiction and epic stuff that has drawn on medieval culture or um, medieval elements. Uh, and so I'm really interested, especially in video games, as to how we use music to represent the past. So that's part of what I'll be talking about today. Hi folks, I'm Ryan Thompson at Michigan State University. I'm a professor of practice there on the game development faculty in the Department of Media and Information. And so I am the, the audio music person on the game development faculty, not working in a school of music, unlike the rest of these folks. Though my PhD uh, is in musicology out of the University of Minnesota. And my research focused on the interactions between gameplay and music. So like times when listening actively makes you a better player. So like if any of you have played Left 4 Dead by Valve, it's like one of those cheap games that all of you should probably own by now. If it's not on a Steam sale, you should just go get it for a dollar or whatever. Uh, each type of special zombie that spawns has its own unique piano mode of sound that plays when it spawns. And because all those sound signifiers exist in the 3D space, you can also know from where it's going to spawn. So if you have headphones on, by definition, you will be a better player listening to that than you are just like playing without sound. And that's usually the type of work I do. I've also got today a little bit of uh, opera material. We'll get to that a little later. <laughs> I'm Dana Plank. I just defended and uh, finished my dissertation and graduated in December. Woo! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, in, 
in historical musicology, my dissertation looks at representations of disability, so injury, disease, and mental illness, in 8 and 16-bit video game soundscapes. So I'm really interested in music and identity as it relates to early game history. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, then we're ready to start with some little um, yes. snippets <laughs> of some of the work that we do. And we'll start with Steve. So as I mentioned in my introduction, I'm a professor of music theory, and that's a very odd discipline, because what we do as music theorists generally is take music that has been written into musical notation, sort of, sort of fixed into place, and then break it down into its component pieces to see how it works. Um, this is all well and good until you remember that for most of human history, this is not how music making actually happens. And in fact, that's how almost none of the music making that's happening here this weekend is going to happen, right? You've got people that come into spaces, improvise, play together, people add, people drop, and, and it's, it's very much non-notated. So we as a discipline have had this little problem that this is what we're good at. We're good at analyzing notated music. We have trouble with non-notated music. For a very long time, I imagined that video game music's closest relative was film music or television music, because after all, you've got moving pictures, and you've got sound, and you've got sound coordinated with it. Uh, but the, most of the work that I do has to do with the way music is dynamic, or the music might change in response to player activity. In other words, the way that music is, in a way, improvised through algorithms. So the algorithms are actually doing the job of impro improvisation, and it's sort of hardwiring that ancient musical practice. So video game music is a lot more like music has always been than film music and TV music. And that's what really excites me. So one of the things that I do is look at the ways in which video game music um, affects or breaks conventional theories of music. And as an example, I wanted to share with you the idea of form. Uh, one thing as music theorists might do is take a piece of music and examine how it's shaped, how themes come back over time. And a very straightforward example of this is in the idea of a theme and variation. So as an example, I'm going to give you a dead white man to consider. <laughs> <laughs> uh, these are the variations on A vous dire je maman. You will know this under a different title. And so the way that a classical set of variations works is that you, you're presented with a very simple, straightforward theme. And over the course of however many variations, it gets more and more complicated. So by the end of the set of variations, the last one sounds like this. And there's sort of a rhetorical growth here. The idea of a variation set is that over time they get more and more complicated, the performer gets to show off their chops a little bit more until you end with this really big flourish. So the idea, the rhetorical idea behind classical variations is this sort of growth of complexity, almost for the purposes of getting more and more and more exciting over time. So I've looked in the past, I've looked at uh, variations in the way that plays out in Portal 2, and I'm going to look at some variations in uh, Super Mario Galaxy today. Uh, two of them in particular. So the first one takes place on Rosalina's observatory. At the, at the beginning of the game, most of the lights are out. You can't go to many of the spaces on the ob observatory, and you get a very sparsely um, instrumented version of the waltz. <laughs> As you all know, throughout the game, the more stars that you accumulate, the more the, uh, the observatory gets powered up until its final flourish. And as this happens, the waltz gets more and more ornamented. So in its second pass, or its final pass, instead of just being a two-voice counterpoint between a cello playing the bass line and the vibraphones playing a melody line, you have a rich accompaniment. You have uh, horns added, violins added, you have counter melodies performed by the flute, and it is a much more lush version of the same waltz. And 
And the narrative purpose is clear. As you are powering up the space station, you're also powering up the music. And this is different than what happens in Mozart. In Mozart, it's about the complexity and virtuosity of the performer. And in Super Mario Galaxy, this is about your performance. This is about your agency in the way that you have interacted with the game world, and it becomes a reward for you. You have done this. You have made the accompaniment much more rich. In another example, it goes the other way. Early on in the game, Mario visits the Battle Rock Galaxy and is treated with these very martial, kind of uh, warlike strains. <laughs> So this particular music comes back in another guise, almost imperceptibly, in something that's called space fantasy on the original soundtrack. And actually what space fantasy is, is it's just one or two of the tracks here that's been stripped away. So you no longer get the march in the strings, you no longer get that really singable melody. All you're left with is this very subtle chord progression played in almost uh, random sounding arpeggios. So the relationship between these two pieces is very, very subtle but it's there. So I'm gonna play a little bit of that and then, then talk about the significance. This is the exact same section of the one we just heard in the track called Space Fantasy. <laughs> So we hear that in several different places. One of the first places we might hear it is in the Dreadnought Galaxy, and the first mission in the Dreadnought Galaxy is where Mario infiltrates. That's the mission name, infiltrating the Dreadnought. And so it's a bit of a stealth mission, and Mario is sneaking on board. And so it seems to me really fitting that the musical accompaniment of the battle theme that takes place on space stations is done in this very surreptitious, hidden way so as almost to not be noticed in much the same way that Mario does not want to be noticed as he's sneaking upon the dreadnought. So that's just a little example of what music theory can do when you apply it to video game music. But again, my interest is in what video game music does to music theory. And it allows us and actually demands that we rethink what our tool sets do. Instead of thinking of theme and variations as this growth towards complexity, the theme and variations ends up becoming a, a, an element of storytelling that relates to you, the character, as the agent of musical change. So thank you so much. Hi. So uh, I'm Karen Cook, again. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, uh, I, I kind of want to break my script for a minute and, and ask you all a quick question. Um, how many of you play games that are medieval in some way? Right, that's kind of what I thought. So let me propose a scenario. Let's say that here at this very moment, uh, it's not happening, but here at this very moment, I am releasing to you a brand new game set in, I don't know, the Crusades or something, some medieval scenario. What is it going to sound like? What sounds do you expect to hear in the medieval past? Are there certain things that you are imagining in your heads right now that are like absolutely going to be part of this soundtrack because it's set in, say, 1400 or whatever? 
Okay, modes, right? Anything else? Like what else? You can shout it out, it's cool. Yeah. Chant, yeah. chant. Yeah. All right, drums, all right, right, cool. Sackbutt. Sackbutt. Did somebody actually say sackbutt? <laughs> yes, yeah, Oh, you win. Um, what's it? No, t yeah, like a lack of a, a lack of meter, a lack of real rhythmic action, maybe uh, some modal stuff, some chant. Um, what any other kind of sounds that you would expect to appear in medieval-ish church bells, right? Okay, so y'all are giving my paper for me. It's great. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, thank you. My work here is done. Uh, no, so the the thing is that none of these sounds really existed in the past, or at least we have no way of knowing. Right? We have a lot of writings and things that tell us about music existing in the past, but we don't have any records. There's nothing that can actually tell us what those things sounded like. So yeah, we know chant existed. The only thing that we know, what, the only reason we know what chant sounds like is because we have recordings from the 20th century. So we, we basically just know what chant sounded like at the time you could start recording it. We have no idea what chant sounded like in the 14th century or the 15th century or the 16th or any, any other time. We don't know what church bells really sounded like unless we have some left over and we can ring them. But even then they might be older than they, they're obviously older than they were. How that might have deteriorated over time, is that really the same sound you would have heard back then? Probably not. There's other stuff in our sound environment that's changed a lot and that's gonna affect how we hear things. So that's one way that uh, scholars often distinguish between medieval studies of like what actually happened in the past and medievalism or how we interpret or receive things from the past. So that's really what I'm interested in uh, a lot in terms of music and video games. And what's interesting about um, medievalism is that this doesn't always have to do with games that are actually set in any sort of historical time period, right? So if you think about uh, something like, uh, you know, Crusader Kings, uh, whatever have you, Anno 1404, all these different games that are set in the medieval past, but then you also have games like, you know, the Sid Meier Civilization series, and you're gonna progress through the past, or you're going to have something like The Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit, which are like a fictitious past. Uh, or then you could have, uh, you know, space exploration, dystopian games that have these medieval elements embedded in them because you're discovering old ruins and whatnot. So medievalism creeps into video games a lot of different ways and not always as you would expect. But a lot of times what we end up hearing, regardless of what kind of video game it is, are the same kinds of musical sounds that you all were just talking to me about. So in my work, uh, a lot of what I've investigated in my research and my publications and my talks have been all of these different sounds and timbres and styles and genres of music that reappear uh, in video games that describe to us sort of collectively, because we exist in this moment together, some idea of the past. Uh, and where those ideas came from. Where do these musical timbres or concepts come from? And this is where video game music is, to a certain extent, similar to film or TV or any other kind of recorded music, concert music. We get, we get ideas about what sounds mean from all of the kinds of music that we hear, right? So uh, I've worked a lot on chant in game music. There's a lot of it and not all of it is real Gregorian chant, some of it's you know, made up Gregorian chant or stuff that's not chant at all, but we call it that because we need a name. Um, so my recent project and one that I'm gonna give you a little preview of uh, has been a, an investigation of how different kinds of medieval sounds have actually come to mean sort of polar opposite things. So if you think about what game music tells us while we play, you know, a lot of times it's giving us clues to the environment that we're in, it's setting a scene, uh, it, it, it paints the picture of what, uh, what landscape we're in, what kind of world this is, but it also gives us clues as to whether we're safe or whether we're in danger, whether we're happy or whether we're sad, whether we're excited or whether we've just finished something, right? So there's these like opposite states of being in games as depending on where you are in, in, excuse me, in your play. And a lot of times these medieval sounds that uh, we've been accustomed to hearing actually play these opposite roles, uh, which is fascinating to me um, because it means that these timbres that we've become so associated with, with the medieval, can actually do kind of a double duty. Uh, they can make us feel in danger and they can make us feel safe and they can make us feel happy and they can make us feel sad and they could tell us where we're uh, in a place of healing or whether there's a bad guy around the corner, so on and so forth. Uh, so in some of my most recent work, I've picked a couple of sounds to trace. Uh, you could do this with any number of sounds. But the three that I chose for us today uh, have to do with the church bell, which somebody called out. Uh, the sound of a church organ, 
actually, uh, which maybe would ring a bell, maybe some of you were thinking of that a minute ago. Uh, and the sound of the voice, uh, not, not chant per se, but that, that uh, sound we've become accustomed to hearing in films and video games where there's no words, it's just ah, you know, a wordless kind of choir or sound. So perhaps you'll notice as I play you this little montage that I'll talk over a bit, uh, you'll probably recognize a lot of these games, but I'm encouraging you to think about how these sounds sort of indicate different things. So the first little snip is going to be uh, the, the, uh, the bell. So you tell, me, you tell me if you need me to pause it. Okay. Yeah, I might I might ask Dana to pause it here. Is it don't but you, you can start. Oh yeah. Oh. <laughs> so here's some good bells. something we ought not to do, and those bells are going to actually alert the guards. Or more Mario. Another wedding, but a gloomy one. Just to pause real quick, so that, that's a little montage of some different kinds of bell scenarios. I've trimmed a lot of examples out of this for time, but there are hundreds and hundreds of games in which bells sort of play these opposite roles of indicating where you can go, there's a temple where you can get healed, or a place where you can hide for a little while, and on the other hand, they're also indicating danger, uh, or maybe even death. Uh, same thing with the organ. The organ, organs existed in the medieval time, but they're not these kind of big churchy Bach-like pipe organs that you think of from a Gothic cathedral. That's one of these things that sort of trickled down to us, like the bells did through Gothic literature. So we actually, we wouldn't have had all these organs in movies or films or video games if it hadn't been for, uh, you know, 18th and 19th century novels that are trying to paint this creepy, mysterious past with all these pipe organs and people playing Bach, Staccato, and Fugue in D minor, and you're a vampire. Um, and then that, that trickles on into silent film, and, and, and there we have it. But organs of, often can also indicate this sort of sense of safety. Safety. Um, in part, like the bell, because they're they're associated with with churches and religion, and so that's one of these elements of the, the a stereotype of the medieval past that's trickled down into modern media that I'll conclude with in a minute. So let's hear some organ examples. <laughs> Famous examples of the actual bad guy playing the actual bad organ himself, of course. I don't, we don't even need to finish the clip, you all know it. Yep. And then 
so like, again, the last musical example that I picked out for today is the sound of the wordless voice. And it could be like a solo singer, but it could also be a whole choir singing songs with, with just vowels. And I, in my work, I've actually kind of argued that this is very much like chant, because chant often has these big melismas that like, la, you know, and it's part of the chant, but there's also other words, and they just forgot the rest of the words. So there's just these big open <laughs> melismas on these open vowels, and it sort of indicates the same kinds of things that chant does. So there's also good examples where you're, you're safe or you haven't even started the game yet, uh, and other instances where they mark you as being in danger, so. to end it there. But, uh, so the, the last point that I want to make with, with my work on these sorts of sounds is that, like I was saying earlier, we have no idea what the actual past sounded like. So any of our ideas, uh, and you all seem to have sort of like this collective idea uh, that you could agree on about what the past is supposed to sound like, uh, and a lot of times they, um, or in all times, these, these come out of stereotypes that we have about the past, and in a lot of times they're kind of harmless, but in other kinds, times they're really dangerous. So uh, all of these particular musical tropes, these these sounds have really strong um, overt connections to the church and we tend to think of the medieval western past as being like all Christian uh, and it wasn't. It was actually a much more diverse period of time than our modern pop culture tends to let on. So one of the things I'm interested in working through and looking at sound is just how we're describing the past and how accurate we're being to um, an, uh, an idea of the past that actually existed, which was much more diverse, uh, much less Christian, much less white, uh, much, much less Western European than maybe even our music gives out. Um, so I'm, I'm really fascinated to see how when we pull out the medieval sounding music and plop it into other genres that really don't have anything to do with the past, are we actually perpetuating some stereotypes that maybe we should be thinking about a little bit more? So that's kind of where I'm going with my current project. Thanks. So Steve talked about uh, sort of the limitations that notation places on us as music scholars, and I'm going to kind of argue the opposite case and talk about how um, transcribing the music that I hear in the video games has actually been a pathway forward for me in my own research. I, I like to start with hearing something interesting in the music and going, oh yeah, what's going on there? And then picking it apart and figuring out how it's working, uh, what's happening behind it, and then using that to springboard outward and then find the social theory and the context and the disability studies in a lot of my work um, to then bring to bear on whatever it is that we're hearing. Um, so my research, as I mentioned earlier, involves the intersections of music and identity and especially music and disability. And so as a part of this research, I'm usually compiling uh, transcriptions of tracks, sometimes entire soundtracks from the NES and the SNES in particular into musical notation. Um, I was trained as a concert violinist. I have a, both an undergrad and a master's degree in violin performance. So I think that that's also why I'm so interested in having notes in front of me, because that's been a lot of my performing career. 
Uh, so I, I compile these examples. I use them in my publications and my conference presentations. I perform these transcriptions because of what the process teaches me about what I'm hearing. Um, it's more for me than for anybody else and how things fit together in the music. And so it's one of the more important tools that I have and I try to perform them really thoughtfully and carefully and shape the transcription to its eventual use. So I'm gonna give you an example of that. Um, just really quickly, the sound chips for NES and SNES, for those that don't know, were programmable sound generators, or PSGs, which generate sound from computer assembly language through oscillators, which means that when I get stuck, I can parse the musical data numerically using a tracking program to learn the exact pitch and its duration. Um, this is a great fail-safe for when my ear fails me as it sometimes does in really quick sweep passages that are too quick to apprehend note by note in the original game. So here's a screenshot of chills, of one measure of chills from Dr. Mario, opened up in NSF import. Um, this is, again, uh, something that I use when I'm trying to figure out, wait, what was that? And then I, I try to slow it down and I still can't figure out, that's when I go to the tracker. From that tracker data, I can create a transcription that looks like this. Holy moly. <laughs> so that's as close as I can get to making it quote unquote accurate. Um, or I could use a musical shorthand like that. <laughs> <laughs> the first one is accurate. That is exactly when those pitches move. <laughs> but it depends on what I need the transcription for. Um, for our purposes today, the most important thing to note is that the eight channels on the Super Nintendo um, of the Sony SPC-700 um, used about four or six different oscillators to create the waveforms and produce these more complex instrumental timbres. And so when I am doing a transcription, I don't put what instrument it is off to the side. You'll see I, I label by channel. Um, and that, that's something that is really important to me because we have this, we all stream together on Thursday nights at 9 p.m. where we analyze the music of the game we're playing in real time. And we're constantly going, what is that? It's like a weird oboe. <laughs> we're always having these arguments or uh, you know, just trying to figure out what exactly the, these uh, early game audio timbres are. So I like to label it by channel, and then that also accounts for the fact that things switch mid-song. You know, things can be a horn sound and then switch to a voice, depending on what the composer needs. And I like to do it that way instead of, you know, a traditional score format, because I think it's interesting how the channels get used. It's like a game of Tetris. Like, okay, now I need a voice, but all of my other channels are in use, so I'm going to switch over the one that I don't need. So I like to see how it's put together that way. So as I mentioned, the purpose of a transcription shapes its form, and that transcription itself can shape how we listen to or understand the video game music that we then hear. If I play an example and I put the music up, you're, you're gonna be looking for those things that I put up on the screen for you. So I'm trying to find that inner architecture of game sound and gain a kind of intimacy and clarity that will drive my own scholarship. But in striving for that accuracy, as you see here, there are moments where the music in the machine refuses to reconcile with kind of our notational convention. That, that first one looks pretty confusing on the page. So I often have to make decisions about whether to privilege integrity or intelligibility based on how I plan to use the example. So here's another one from Super Mario RPG. Sad Song is a slow, simple 12 measure waltz that sounds like it's being performed on an out of tune honky tonk piano. This track is associated with Mallow, seen there crying as he often is. The squishy, ostensibly orphaned prince from the clouds raised in a swamp by frog Fuchsius. Let's listen to this, it's a real short loop, with all of its pathos. When the group of us played through this game on our weekly Twitch streams, I remarked that Sad Song really reminded me of the music of Frederick Chopin, 19th century composer known for his solo piano music. Uh, so this example is his Nocturne Number no. 1 in B-flat minor. Has 
that same kind of feel to it, right? So those are some of the other ones that I thought it was sort of similar to listening through. But the sheet music I showed you for sad songs actually a reduction. When I transcribed the sound data channel by channel, I found the following texture. What's happening here is pretty simple. It's creating extra echo and sustain by separating the individual notes in the texture and holding them out for a longer duration. This creates a more organic and realistic sound and almost like a live performance on an acoustic instrument uh, in a large hall. That extra reverb also in music tends to associate with interiority and memory, which is really fitting to Mallow's turmoil. So if I'm interested in demonstrating how that effect is created, I might opt for this full score broken down by channel. But for an audience of music scholars, I would likely also include that reduction at the top as I've done here, which is far easier to apprehend. It's way more musically intelligible, and it looks a little more like a standard piano score. And it looks more like the Chopin. So if I'm doing that comparison, I can put those side by side. So I use my transcriptions as a jumping off point for my methodology. I like to start from something interesting and then let it take me beyond the notation into the theory and context helping me figure out where to go next. Uh, it, hopefully into areas that are not only personally fulfilling, but hopefully illuminating for my friends and colleagues. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> didn't mean to play that again. I'm always jealous of people who can do transcription well, because it is not a skill that I possess at all. And in fact, when I was originally preparing the book chapter I'm going to be summarizing the next three to five minutes for you from Final Fantasy VI. Uh, Jarrell Jones is sitting right there in the front of the audience, and he actually just finally did the last transcription for me, because I suck at it. I, am <laughs> I was like, please, please help me so I can be done. Uh, I like to look at uh, the relationship, as I said, between gameplay and music. And in the case of Final Fantasy VI, that has to do with how all of Final Fantasy VI is structured. Uh, for those of you, how many of you in the room have played FF6 in any context before? Yes, this is the only room on the whole planet I can make that assumption. I love MAGFest. Okay. <laughs> uh, for those of you who have not played it, by far the most famous and well-known sequence in Final Fantasy VI is about a 20, 25-minute opera scene that you must play through as the performing soprano, and then you have to run above the rafters and help prevent the opera from being disrupted as the rest of it goes on. But the opera sequence is what people remember about Final Fantasy VI. And I was thinking as I was playing it, uh, on stream about, what, a year, a year and a half ago now? Mm -hmm. uh, that a lot of Final Fantasy VI is structured as an opera. It's not just it has an opera scene, it's that the whole game is designed around the idea of opera. So for instance, here, this is about maybe a half an hour into the game, assuming you're playing at a pretty quick clip. Uh, but every new character you find, you get this little blurb about. It tells you something about the character. So Sabin here is Edgar's twin brother. Uh, I will note that this introductory blurb is lying to you. He did not trade the throne for his own freedom. Those of you who have played the game uh, know that it's a little more complex than that. <laughs> but this is our introduction to who the character is. He's the twin brother of the king. And this format comes to us from the world of opera. So if you see here, uh, my apologies that it is in the original Italian up there on the board, <laughs> uh, but this is the first page of the score to Handel's Rinaldo. And the font's a little bit tiny, uh, but after each character's name, there's a little blurb about who that person is. Uh, oftentimes, these are reprinted in modern programs because it turns out that most people who go see Italian opera in this country don't speak or read Italian. Uh, and so, but they'll, they'll, you'll get six words about who these people are. So for instance, the second character there, Almirena, is uh, engaged to Rinaldo, who is listed as the protagonist, the, uh, the hero del campo. Uh, and you get just a tiny little glimpse into who this character is, the same way we get a glimpse into who Sabin is in Final Fantasy VI. Uh, in the opera sequence itself, there was a moment that always confused me. And maybe you guys will remember this. Right after the main characters who are not performing in the opera go sit down to watch the opera begin from the back of the rafters, the impresario is seated with you at that point. He sits down next to you. And then suddenly he appears on the stage. And it's like, well, this guy doesn't know magic. Heck, I don't even know magic yet. What's <laughs> going on? Uh, he's not teleporting. They use his sprite over this text 
to indicate that he authored the program notes to the opera. And what's being communicated to you here is that this is the characters leafing through the program booklet before the opera begins <laughs> to get just a taste of what is going to happen. Uh, this is further reinforced by the biggest symbol of the end of the game being the libretto to the game as opera proper. Uh, operas, and for that matter, Broadway musicals, uh, and all sorts of staged productions are often organized into multiple acts. Final Fantasy VI is also neatly organized along that type of structure at a very broad level. Every time an important character wakes up in a bed, those of you who know the game well, the game is pretty clearly broken into three major components. The first one is pictured here, where after a very short prologue where you're riding through this badass Magitek armor, the game then takes that away and is like, oh, well, the real game is you with nothing. Here you go. Uh, <laughs> and Terra wakes up in this bed with amnesia, and the plot begins. Uh, about 10 hours or so after this point, Locke, the thief character, wakes up in this exact same bed after the first major plot line gets resolved, where the first act is about Terra's journey to rediscover that Esper she interacts with in the prologue. As soon as that happens, the game opens up in a new way. We discover new types of gameplay. We get magic right after that point. Uh, and then, of course, the third act is uh, the world of ruin, where a different character wakes up in a bed after a significant time gap, and the game is changed significantly. I'll avoid the spoiler for the four of you that didn't raise your hands. Uh, <laughs> and it actually it took me a very long time to do this, but part of the work in thinking about organizing the game as an opera is I played the game doing only what was required to see every significant cutscene in the game. So like, I didn't revisit South Figaro more than once, right? You go there once, you visit, you meet Shadow, then you go to Mount Colts and you're done. You don't go back, per se. If you follow the straight line through the game, there's a certain fixed order that you'll hear music in. And I've omitted battle, 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 battle. But otherwise, like, there is a clear fixed track order that is, uh, it turns out it's about 3,000 words long to just type out the track names every time. It's like 40 pages or so. Uh, but you can see there's scene one of act one as I have fixed it in my notes. And each major event, so you start with the prologue, then you've got Terra through the mines is scene two. Locke getting Terra out of the mines after she falls and injures herself is scene three, and so on and so forth. Uh, and we can order, organize every major sequence along the lines of opera. Uh, one of the other things that comes to us from an operatic tradition, but it's also very strongly associated with film scoring, is this idea of uh, a leitmotif, a character theme that returns in multiple contexts. Final Fantasy VI, more than any of the other Final Fantasy games, is really dependent on this idea. Many characters have two versions of their themes, one of which we usually hear the main theme first, so Locke's theme, da, I should get my automaton, da, 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 da. Right, it's a big, brassy, heroic, not thief theme. <laughs> and uh, later on, assuming you do the side quests and you poke around and figure out what his past is, you hear this very like melancholy version of that theme, which is Forever Rachel, one of the game's better known tracks. And that is really the heart of who Locke's character is, is throughout the majority of the game, he's really thinking and journeying for Rachel, not for himself. Uh, Setzer is the same way, where Daryl's theme as he descends the tomb to get the airship out of the ruins is his like inner secret theme, if you will. The opera weirdly works backwards. Uh, the opera is of course a variation on Celis's theme, but I would argue to you today and we'll hear it now, it's the variation we hear first. Do I have to click to yeah. get it to go? Okay. So this is the first time when you hear the opera sequence here that you hear anything with Celis's melody. And it'll kick in in a minute. We'll take a moment. Better. 
version of the theme is highly romanticized. Go back one here. Uh, unlike every other character in Final Fantasy VI, we hear this version of her theme first, and this is what she secretly wants to be, what she returns to in her mind. This is the idealized version of Celis. We don't hear, for lack of a better term, the truth about who she is, and those of you who have played the game know that she's the product of significant abuse and very difficult uh, hardships, to the point where, at the beginning of the third act, and I want you to notice the staging here. Here's the castle in the opera sequence. And there is the cliff upon which she jumps uh, in an, a suicide attempt shortly after the beginning of the game's third act. I would argue the cliff and the castle are perfectly positioned to recall one another. So when you see this, uh, you'll notice that she follows the trajectory of the flowers she throws from the balcony. Uh, and you hear this piece of music, which is called Celis on the soundtrack. This is her theme, and they purposely avoid giving it to you until this moment. Because unlike the rest of the cast, whose main theme that signifies them specifically is usually adventurous and happy, uh, Celis doesn't have that. This is her main theme given to us in the opposite order of the rest of the cast, in part to define her journey in Acts 2 and 3 as the central conflict of that part of the story. Uh, and yeah, sorry, we needed something funny after that to like <laughs> lighten the mood in the room, so now you have her singing in front of the uh, Ultras, the octopus. <laughs> I really like looking at the way games are structured when that happens to line up with a musical interest. Final Fantasy VI isn't the only game to do that, but it's certainly the most well-known that follows so clearly a musical narrative. Uh, anyway, thanks for listening. I'm looking forward to the Q&A after this. <laughs> All right, guys, so we're sort of running out of time, so I'm going to actually kind of speed through mine. Um, I'm going to skip my clip, which is the oh shit moment in Super Mario World when you're running out of time and you hear an alarm. Da -da 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 this is like every Mario game, right? Um, and Mario Kart as well. And uh, the music gets faster. And so the clip, I, don't, I hope I can skip through it. Don't play it. It was a very average sort of playthrough. <laughs> um, there you go. So in Super Mario World, this alarm happens, and what you would have seen was the player starts to just go really fast towards the end. This is just a very standard kind of idea of, you know, you in the beginning, um, you're sort of trying to maybe grab all the coins and do whatever, and then, but once the time is running out, you have to get to the end. The main goal becomes apparent. Um, and so, uh, you know, we could just say, okay, so the music cues the player to go faster. The end. Wonderful. Um, but I like to think more about the moment of the oh shit. What is that feeling and why don't we talk about it more? Why don't we talk about, in, at least in music theory, um, as an academic study, uh, the feelings around play? Um, so... Here we go, yes, music. <laughs> Feelings are the things that underlie play, underlie the way that we interact with games, underlie our thoughts and our, fe and, well, feelings that can't really underlie feelings, um, but how we make meaning out of, out of our interactions. 
And so my, a lot of my dissertation is around theorizing this. And so one thing I bring in is affect theory, and there's this book called Playing with Feelings, um, if you're interested in affect theory, which is a kind of like about emotions and the sort of potential energy um, underlying a lot of our actions uh, by Aubrey Annable. It came out last year. Um, really good talking about how video games allow us to kind of rehearse certain kinds of emotions. Very interesting, talks nothing about music. And music we know is very emotional and it really brings up a lot of uh, kinds of feelings in video games and it can make you go, oh shit, <laughs> I have to go to the end. So I also, I'm thinking about affordance theory. Um, thinking and using uh, Don Norman's uh, Design of Everyday Things is an awesome book. Um, one, so the idea of affordances is just that there are objects in the world, like a door, for instance, um, that their design, uh, the visual outlet, out. Uh, outlay of their design affords certain interactions. So if a, there's a panel on a door, that affords pushing, whereas a knob or a handle would afford, afford pulling. Um, so he talks about a lot of badly designed doors. And you can bring this into video games. Um, and I've talked about how, you know, platforms afford jumping onto, especially because there is a nice little coin there, which is so shiny that it affords getting. Um, and so bringing this all in, the idea of emotions and how that underlies a lot of actions, but a lot of the design of the game itself, and thinking about how music kind of creates boundaries for this. And so what I sort of come, across, uh, come up with is this idea of affective zones where music, the slow music or the standard tempo music, um, creates a zone where you sort of play in a standard way perhaps, and then the fast music kind of affords, it doesn't necessarily mean that you actually play in a faster way, but it affords faster actions and it perhaps makes you see things in the world differently. Like I, I don't, maybe you don't see uh, secrets as f easily because you're just trying to go towards the end. So it's not about what music makes players do, it's about what music, the potential of what music can do to make you feel a certain way to perhaps do something. So my work is a lot about that potential. And that is it, that's my quickie uh, <laughs> snippet. And so we're gonna open it up to any questions that anybody has about basically anything. Oh, oh. oh I forgot. <laughs> Thank you. Does this work? Okay, yeah. So well, where do you get your funding? Our funding? Is that, was that the question? Where do we get our funding? Of course, it's the money question. Yes. Yeah, um, <laughs> so in typical PhD programs, you will have a stipend, and they will fund you. Um, that's not the case for all. PhD programs are different all over. And in American PhD programs, you'll get a stipend. Um, and then once you get a job, you hopefully have a job that gives you a salary. Once you get a job, it's like a giant <laughs> leap I want to point out to everybody. Yes. It's like, it makes it sound so simple. <laughs> but, like, but like for your research, are you just like researching with, with your free time or is someone actually giving so you money to So you're paid to, to do this. So a part of your PhD is this research. This is what you're paid to do. You're paid to write yeah, your dissertation. For the, for, the, for the faculty members, like, are you? Oh, yes. You guys can talk about we that. We all have different appointments. I am 80% teaching, 20% office meetings, and 0% research. I'm not being paid to do this right now. I just wanted to come to MAGFest. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're not being paid for this. Yeah. It, it varies. Your okay. mileage may vary. All right, but, all right. yeah, just really quickly. Most of the time that we will have some ability, maybe at our, depending on what institution you're at, perhaps they will be able to give you some money to do some of your work uh, or whatnot. Yeah. So, all right, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, Before really we go quickly, to the next question, I want to, I want to, uh, yeah, yeah. Shout out to the North American Conference on Video Game Music. This is the first academic conference on video game music in North America, uh, which started in 2014. We're now looking at our sixth year, which is going to be at the University of Hartford. Where I live. So those so of you on the East Coast, uh, if you want to come hear lots of people talk about game music for like two days, you're welcome to come to that. Yes, please do. Yes. <laughs> scan that or talk to us after. All right, next question. Uh, yes, uh, my question is basically for all of you. Is or will your dissertations be available to read anywhere? Oh yeah, they're... Those of us who have our PhDs, are you guys on ProQuest? Are you published? Yeah, but my, mine has nothing to do with video game music, but I certainly have publications out there that are open to the public. Sure, they're findable. Also, Almost when every doubt, academic is really happy to just give you their work. Yes, so even yes. though it's behind email a paywall, us. if you t tweet or email us, we would be happy to send you whatever we have. Okay, yeah, yeah. Totally. great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, follow us on Twitter and then just hit us, hit us with a DM and we'll send you stuff. Yeah. <laughs> 
Hi, yeah, I just had a question about um, uh, any like composition styles that are very definitively video game, like the Locrian church mode or diminished tools are usually used to like build stress and tension, and they're used a lot more heavily towards the end of games more than like you would see them in normal like popular music or something like that. I was just mm -hmm. wondering if there are any other constructions or forms that you see and can definitively say like, that's video game music probably. Like, so like we actually have a word for this when something is written specifically for the instrument that it's being performed on, we call that being idiomatic. Uh, and if you hear something like Tim Fallon's NES titles, yeah. <laughs> he does all sorts of like ridiculous arpeggiation and sweeps mm -hmm. throughout the sound chip that a human performer, like you can't do it. It's yeah, not about yeah. being good, it's about human fingers don't move that Having way. Having a lack of channels. Uh, and and so in, yeah. there's definitely certain styles that are unique mm -hmm. to electronic music. Uh, and certain styles that like come up a ton in video game music as a result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, short answer, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, first off, great panel to all five of you. Thank you know, you. you're, you're all you. a lot more scholarly than I am, but you were clear, you're concise, engaging, understanding. It was great. Um, the question I had, this is just something I've been curious about, is you talked a lot about how music will influence a game or how music is put into a game for more of the narrative aspect. What about music in a game for the more mechanical aspect, like rhythm games or Super Hexagon or Mother 3, as a lot of the people out here will like? Uh, yes. <laughs> Um, what, 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 are some, what are some differences you found between how composers will approach or engage music in their games when the music is actually more of a mechanic than a narrative? Well, I think that's an interesting question. I wouldn't say that I'm particularly the authority on, on this panel of that, but there, um, uh, like Peter Schultz, uh, is as a person who does rhythm game, um, music theory and rhythm games. Um, and you, it's really interesting to see, for instance, what kind of parameters, what layers of rhythm of, of a different track are utilized for certain actions, um, whether it's like sort of the percussive layer or a bass layer um, or maybe like a, a higher flute or like a, a bell kind of layer and what kinds of actions that's supposed to be synchronized with. And this sort of varies by game, by level, by style. A lot of it's really linking up with visual aesthetics. Um, and uh, if, if, or just like even technological aesthetics, like an 8-bit style, that kind of thing. Um, but it's, it's a really interesting question, and there are people working on it, though I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I actually did some work on uh, BitTrip Runner, and I was looking yeah, at the yeah. way that the music is pre-composed. Most of the time when you have a video game music, um, like with film, the composer is given the scenario and says, write some music that's going to sound good here. And that's not how it works in BitTrip. It was the other way around. So David Kanagi wrote the score first, handed it off to the, the programmers who then would create the levels. So the level design in that game for all of those levels is, is very musical in nature. Uh, we like to hear music in, for example, um, duple rhythm. So we like things to be even. We like all of our meters to come in powers of two. It's just kind of what we're used to doing. And so all of the obstacles in Bit Trip Runner also come in powers of two. And as you play through the level, you're enacting these very kind of uh, familiar rhythms to us. And I was sort of suggesting or positing, what would it be like if it were the other way around? What if the game designers had created the levels and then handed the music off to say, OK, make a rhythm level out of this? It would be tough as nails. It would be tough as nails. But it would also probably be musically nonsensical. Sure. So we wouldn't be able to understand what we were hearing, and that would probably also really impact our ability to play through the level, too. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Thanks, guys. Welcome to MAGFest. Thank you. Thank yep. you. Hi. So specifically, I was wondering about the idea of affordances that you talked about there at the mm -hmm. end, and what other kinds of affordances aside from just excitement and how do you draw the line between between like one different kind of affordance and another? Do you know what I mean? So like, yeah. what's the difference between like excitement and happy, and like where is that gray space in between? Um, and then what other effects those might have? Um, so um, I mean, you might be talking about affect theory. See, I went okay. so fast, and they both start with an yeah. A, um, which is more about the emotions. Whereas affordances is what what kind of interactions the visual design will. I see privilege or invite. So for instance, a platform will invite jumping on top right. of that kind of thing. Um, and that really is special to certain games. And affect theory is really talking about 
Um, it's a really, it's interesting that you bring the difference between excitements and ha excitement and happiness and those kinds of things. I mean, even in just like basic psychology and neuroscience, the difference between being like scared and being excited is not any different really physiologically. Right. And it registers very similarly in terms of skin tests and like, you know, your heart rate and that kind of stuff. So um, it's all, a lot of it is how you cognitively appraise your own body's reactions to things. Um, and so, and, you know, in like therapy, they're like, you know, you need to like change your own fear into excitement and that kind of thing. I don't know how much that works for people, but um, uh, so there, the difference there is, is really player by player. And that's it's what, what I'm interested in is thinking about how not music doesn't determine anything really. Right. It's really what the player brings and what the player is bringing to this particular playthrough even and how they can maybe subvert um, or, or do different things based on whatever mood they're in. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Uh, do you guys think there was a point in history where like uh, the thematic analysis you might do on like Final Fantasy VI, it makes sense to do that, but it doesn't make sense to do it on old games like Atari. Like, there was like a point at which where it, music in video games started becoming a more serious thing, uh, or do you think it just happened naturally one day? Oh, I, that, that, I, I don't know if I can say it succinctly. Um, I am really against the idea of this kind of uh, teleological progression as if there's this grand narrative and it gets better and better and better just because we have more technological affordances. So one of the reasons that I stick in early 8-bit audio is because I like to show just how much complexity and thought goes into that and just how much brilliance is in some of the workarounds in the code and, and the ways that they knew how to use these sound chips. They really played them like instruments. Um, and so... The, the, the short answer is I think there's a lot more complexity there than the, the blips and bloops might belie. Uh, yeah. yeah. One, well, I'm not a specialist on this, but one of our colleagues that presents at the, the conference that's going to be in March has, has shown how the Atari generates sound, and it's fascinating, because most mm -hmm. of the time when we deal with acoustic sound, it's all based on overtones from a bass fundamental. But the way the Atari generates sound is by dividing an oscillator into a bunch of ways. And you can't actually get the same pitches when you divide as when you, when you build from the ground up. So they have this horrible gamut of pitches <laughs> which are in tune and out of tune and then you just have to slit right up, drop some of them. If they're more than 40 cents or, or you know, 40% of a, of, a, of a semitone away, you actually just can't use the note. Mm. So you have gaps in the scale which you can play, <laughs> things you can't play. Some of the things you're gonna play are gonna sound really weird to our ears. And so then if you're a composer, and that's your tool set. You have to be incredibly creative about the ways you select pitches, the way you recompose things, and it ends up really putting your chops to the test. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Super quick, you all mentioned that you stream on Twitch. Where? Oh, yeah, Thursday nights, usually from about 9 to 11. Occasionally we go later. That's Eastern time. Eastern. Mm -hmm. Eastern. Uh, we are on twitch.tv slash bardic knowledge. Mm -hmm follow any of us on Twitter and we tend to tweet it out, so. Yeah. Why, thank you. Uh-huh. We're not quite as good live as we are prepared. <laughs> depends on the game, depends, <laughs> you know, when we've heard the battle theme for the 80th time in our sixth week, week of a run, we do start talking about, like, whiskey or, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> or music talking programs about whiskey. or things we're working on. Um, I was uh, curious about... Um, uh, the transcription work, and I, I had a roommate in college who played jazz trumpet, and he would do these incredibly detailed transcriptions of like all these jazz pieces. Um, and I was wondering if you had like a guiding star for where you put that trade-off between like um, sort of interpret interpretation and like the precision of of what. So you know, is this a bunch of really fast notes or is it a glissando? if there's like a, a guiding star on that or um, if you have a set of rules like how you approach that problem, I guess. So generally I'll do that quote unquote accurate transcription first. Um, and then depending on what I need to use it for, I may decide, oh, you know, okay, it's gonna be much easier to apprehend if I just put it as a glissando. Um, so it really depends how I'm going to use it. Um, if I'm going to be publishing, or sometimes I'm not talking about the pitches, I'm talking about maybe the rhythm or a different piece of the music. So if I'm talking about the rhythmic element, then I wanna have fidelity to the rhythm. So I might have that really complicated one in that instance. So it really depends what element of the music I'm trying to highlight at that moment and sort of the venue. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, 
chips there are only so many different types of timbres that you have available to you as a composer and so ultimately you're going to pick whichever one yeah yeah uh it depends on how old we're talking about like on the super nintendo they can actually take a a sampled sound and kind of make it happen a little bit uh especially as you get into more complicated super nintendo games the sample quality gets noticeably better uh on a true chiptune system, uh, and the Super Nintendo kind of cheats there for technological reasons I've just been told I don't have time to explain. Yes. Uh, but on a chiptune, like an NES or a Sega Master System or an Atari type situation, you, there's only so many different ways those waveforms can be configured. You're just gonna, as a composer, do the best you can and hope that people understand it as a voice. It turns out that the voice is really difficult to do. <laughs> Part of the reason uh, that we get a lot of like harpsichord type timbres on the NES is because that's what those oscillators are good at doing. Uh, Sorry, we actually have we do have to wrap it up. Yeah. We are going to continue us outside, this though. though. Please, yeah. Come talk we are going to we are continue all these co uh, conversations, but we are over time and we want to be good citizens yeah. of Magfest. So yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks for sticking around.